I'm assuming that most of you don't have partners, except one of your group was um, working on it over the, over the weekend, right? And it looks like they were the most finished as what have you, right? Um, and it's a good good thing to start the project earlier just because we don't have enough enough space or hardware for in that room, right? So um, please find a partner as soon as possible. Like I said, you don't have to find a person who's, who's better than you or, or there's, there's not a race to the top, right? I just want you, everybody to catch up to um, what, you, what you want to do. So um, find a partner. It's not, it's not so important who the partner is. It's important that the partner pulls their weight. If they don't do anything in their project, for one project, you guys may work it out such that you don't do on this one, maybe you work on the next one sort of thing. But if, if one person is not habitually doing any work, let me know. Right? It's not up to you to um, figure out because the grain is for the whole group. Right? So if one of one of you is not playing the weight and the other person is doing all the work, then you have to do twice as much work. That's not fair. Right? So are there any questions from, from what we covered so far? <laughs> So when we uh, left, left in the last lecture, we were talking about system cost, right? That's the way for you to interact with the with the operating system. And one of the commands I mentioned, which you can find in most Linux boxes, is the is the S trace command, which tells you all the system calls that are being made by an application, right? So I have a Linux machine here, and I'm running a small program called Day, which basically tells you what the current time is, right? It's a very simple program. You don't expect it to do too much, it just asks the system what the current time is and then and then fence it, right? So if you do a S trace of the uh, program, which basically tells you trace of all the system calls being made by the program, <coughs> I have to pipe it through more because it's a lot of it, right? Three, two. So essentially you can see these are the system calls which are called on your behalf for you to run this little date program, right? So you, you've made that many interactions with the operating system. So for example, um, you may not know many of these functions, you may know some of the stuff. Exec V basically says, start this program for me. Um, and then it, it tries to figure out what operating system is running on. You name it, uh, what, what operating system is running on. It allocates some memory using break, right? Then it, bunch of, it, it opens a bunch of library calls, libraries to figure out where the other program, where the functionality for the program is, right? We don't have to go through all the details, but I just want you to get a sense of how much effort is done to give you this simple program called date. I mean, date you expect it to just ask the system what's the current date and print it out. But it goes through a whole bunch of stuff, and if you look at the arguments, those are the arguments that are called to the function. So this open was called to open this file with this mode. And it returned an error message of my negative one. The, the kernel said negative one, which means no entry or no such file or directory. Right? So this is a good way to debug your program if you go beyond uh, uh, where you are. So you can kind of see where, where the things are. And so this will give you a sense of how, how much interaction has to happen in the operating system. Right? Do not even try this for stuff like PowerPoint or something, because you're going to see a whole bunch of interactions with the operating system. Right? And you'll see somewhere way down there, you will you will ask what the what the time is through a file file interface. And I don't want to go into the details of how these things are done. Um, that's not really important for this. Right? So let's let's get back to where we were, right? So we're still trying to give a big picture of what operating systems are, the structure, and all those things. So today we'll continue with the system call. How do we interact with the operating system? So we saw that you can interact through a command line or GUI kind of interface, but really you interact through system calls. Right? You interact with system calls, and you use APIs to program those system calls. Right? The next little abstraction about those are system programs. Right? It's and, and we'll, we'll see what those are. There's no real hard and hard definition of what what those are. Essentially, they help you use the system easier. Right? So for example, this date command. It's not earth shattering, and if you can write this program in a few minutes, but it's a nice tool that you get to use, right? And there are, there are legal arguments about what is the system program, what is not, right? So if you followed the Microsoft, uh, the last suit, essentially they're claiming that Internet Explorer was a system program, uh, whether it is or not, it's up to the courts to decide. But for us, most of the things, we just have an uh, easier definition. And then we talk about how you would design an operating system, some of the notions of uh, microkernels and, and so on. Right. So 
again, as, like I said, system programs are defined as programs which you tend to use to make your job easier, right? So things like compilers and chat and email, what, what have you. These are the sort of things that you can sort of use. So when you think of a Linux machine, right, which you may use on, on the lab, lab machine, there's a Linux kernel, which is what you're going to operate for your uh, project, right? That is called Linux kernel. <coughs> You'll say version 2.6 two or what have you, right? And the kernel itself is very, very uh, hard to program or boring to program. If you just boot it, boot it up the kernel, there is no way for you to interact with the system, right? You don't have a like a shell. You don't have anything else to build on top of it. So you have all these systems programs which make it useful. So you can log in, you have a screen, you have editors, and all those things where you can write your program, right? And there's a whole bunch of examples here. Um, and some of them help you figure out what's going on in the system. Some of them make you productive using web, web browser or editors or compilers or what have you. And all of them call system class underneath to perform the operations for you, right? In a lot of aspects, these are no different from your program. It's just that it's provided to you uh, as a system. So when you log into a Linux machine, you expect a certain number of help rather than a, a blank machine. The other stuff which we're not going to go through in too much detail beyond this is how to boot this machine, how to boot up this machine, right? So we have this hardware. We have hardware which can do nothing. It's just, it's just an inanimate object. And you have an operating system, right? The, the issue is how do you boot up this hardware? How do you make this operating system start to run, right? So how do you bootstrap this process? How do you make this hardware understand this operating system, right? So the, the challenge here is the hardware need not know anything about the operating system, right? You would hope that the hardware does not have to know anything about the operating system. But if it knew nothing about the operating system, then it knows nothing about what's in the hardware. It knows nothing about what's in the hard disk. It knows nothing about anything. So without knowing nothing, the hardware cannot boot up, right? So your challenge is to tell enough information to the your machine so that it can call the right operating system services to boot itself up, right? Does that make sense? So when you, when you buy a machine, it, it, know, it knows nothing about the hardware. It knows nothing about what hard disk is connected to it, what is the way it's structured and all those things, right? So if you buy a PC, it could run Linux, I could run Windows, I could run FreeBSD or what have you. The, the one you buy from vendor like uh, Dell or IBM can run anything you want, right? So the hardware itself knows nothing about what operating system you're going to run. Right? And each operating system does it differently. So you can't take a Linux machine and run Windows without destroying Linux. So something on the hard disk says it's a Linux machine, something says it's a Windows machine. Right? So how do you go from a hardware that you buy from Dell, which knows nothing, to something that boots up whatever operating system you want is a challenge. Right? And the way you do that is called a bootstrap process. And the, the way you do that is something called, so we'll, we'll see some of this like pretty late in the, in, the, in the semester. Essentially what you do is you have conventions. So when you buy a machine from Dell, Dell may have convention to say, when a machine is, when you uh, plug in a machine, you'll go to a ROM uh, firmware boot code, right? So you'll go to ROM, you'll boot up something, right? Many of you may have seen that when you boot up a machine, it brings something saying how much memory there is. It'll do some kind of a probing of the system, right? There has to be a standard that everybody agrees to. In, in this case, it's called BIOS, right? So it goes, so it automatically hardware goes to the stuff, it figures out all the things it needs to know about the hardware, right? And then you have conventions <coughs> such that we will go to the you know, certain hard disk and we'll read sector zero, right? Which, which means that we'll start reading from the zeroth block of a hard disk, right? So any operating system you, you build has to put something at that sector which tells so if you put a program in that sector which which knows how to do the rest of the process, right? So the way it works is you, you bring this machine, the machine itself does this bio stuff, it figures out where the hardware, where the disks are. So it knows what there's a hard disk. It knows that in the hard disk you are supposed to go to a certain location and you're supposed to read whatever program is in there, and you're supposed that program is supposed to know how to boot up your machine. If any of this is messed up, your machine cannot boot up, right? So if you have, if you go to a, your BIOS, right? If you, if you want to have a BIOS, you can try those machines too. If you change the BIOS to say, don't try this hardware, this particular hardware, 
then your machine won't boot because it does not know how to proceed, right? If you if you mess up that boot sector, right, which means that the BIOS will go through, and then the program it calls does not know what to do, right? You will face this when you do the project, right? If you mess up something, if you don't write this uh, the boot partition properly, then your machine will start will stop booting. Then you have to you have to go back to a previously running one, right? So. So when, when you, so be aware of that you are going through these different processes to make, get these things going. For the most part, it will work fine, but some of you may run into a problem where you corrupted the boot sector or something. In which case, the machine will just will stop. And if it does, usually you can go back to uh, you, you have made it to say some you know boot up some other kernel. And if you can't proceed, let one of us know, right? Because you have corrupted the boot sector. It's easy to that over, but that's one of the things that you will, you will have to face. So essentially, so all, all these processes are necessary to make this process, uh, the machine boot up. So you have to go through these little stuff, and, and all of them are designed by the hardware. So the, this is all happens before the operating system is started. So it, it has no control over what should be there, right? Except these two have to work together. If the BIOS says, I'm going to read sector one, Windows cannot decide to read from, you know, put the file system in sector zero, and things so on, right? The other stuff, once the operating system gets controlled, you can build an operating system where it knows precisely what the hardware is and it knows precisely how to proceed, right? And, and that's one way to uh, proceed, which means that it knows that it, it's going to have, let's say, NVIDIA graphics card, you know, 4300 series, right? It's going to know exactly what the processor is, exactly what the graphics card is, exactly everything. If you know everything, then it, it can boot up very fast because it knows what the hardware is. It, it can just start like that, right? But most real machines are not that strict. You don't want them to be that strict. You want to be able to change the stuff. So what that means is, when the operating system boots up, it has to figure out what's in there. It has to figure out what hard disk is in there, what graphics card is in there. It has to figure out all the hardware, hardware so it can figure out whether it can talk to each of the hard, hardware, right? Many of you may have seen that it will say, I've noticed that you have a new printer. I don't have the driver. Give me a driver, right? And driver is a way for the, for the operating system to talk to those machines. So it has to first go through the sysgen process to figure out what is the status of the machine. So it can initiate all its data structures and then it can proceed, right? And that's what you will see when you, when you boot up the machine. You'll see it goes through a lot of operations on, you know, starting the hard disk, resetting the hard disk, doing something here, doing something there. A whole bunch of stuff. Many operations like Windows and stuff don't show it to you because it, they, they don't want people to be confused, right, or, or, or whatever reason. But you have ways to look at all the stuff and you see it will go through a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if any of those fail, it may or may not be able to recover, right? So if it finds that it cannot read the, the hard disk, most operating systems will stop because there's nothing they can do, right? Unless it's a hard disk that's not necessary, right? So if the operating system disk itself, it does not know how to read, it'll stop, right? You will f you'll probably face that when you do the, um, you build your kernel too, right? The reason you'll face that is when you build your kernel, if your kernel did not know about a particular hardware, then it cannot proceed, right? So when you do the configuration, when you go through the configuration, you'll have different configuration parameters for hard disk, network, and all those things. You're free to go and change anything you want, right? But sometimes you notice that if you change something that it does not even know how to proceed, then it will fail, right? And sometimes it looks funny because your machine knows enough to boot it up, but the operating system will say, I don't know how to read the hard disk, right? Which is kind of funny because it came all the way partially where it could read something, but it can't proceed, kind of stuff, right? And if you face that, again, go back and you know, try a different kernel, right? And if you're stuck, let us know, right? Does it make sense? So this is this is what happens when you boot up the machine. So how many of you complain that when you boot up a machine, it takes a while to start up? Right? How, how many of you like would like the computer when you turn it off, you turn it back on, instantaneously it comes back on? Right? I mean, kind of a bad question, right? Like I, I can't imagine somebody saying, "No, I want the machine to be slow. I want to wait for half an hour." Right? But see, that's the challenge that they they try to work with, right? But, like for Microsoft. They have no motivation to make it slow either, right? But they have to get all the stuff. If you don't know what the hardware is, right, it cannot really, um, it cannot really do, do a good job, right? If it, if it knows that there's a, you have a hard disk, it has to know what kind of hard disk you have, how much capacity, what, what buffer, and all those things. And all those things take time, right? 
So they do different stuff to make you feel good. One of the ways they do that is to, to do it concurrently with, with you, right? So they know about enough hard, hardware to boot up, and they hope that you're typing your password slowly. So while you're typing a password, it, it's still doing stuff, right? So since it's doing in, in a fashion where you don't notice it, you think things are going faster, even though it's not going faster. And you may notice, like, afterwards you need something, and then, then you wait after you log in. But for the most part, it kind of goes through, right? You may notice it you know, on some of the newer digital cameras, right? If you use digital cameras, if you use the older generation, when you start the camera, right, it'll take a while to boot up. You can see the, it'll, it'll pop up some uh, logos of the camera, then you'll, you'll see it, it'll boot up slowly, right? How many of you remember the older days, right? But if you look at the newer cameras, like the Nikon Digital One, which I know for a fact, they boot up very fast. If you turn it on, it's almost instantaneously on, right? And they do the same thing. It's not like they magically, because they, there they have to know what kind of a memory card you have, what's in there, right? So they do this in parallel. So when you put up, when you start the camera, it immediately takes you to a point where you can take pictures. It does not know whether there's hard drive. It does not know whether there's any place to store. It lets you take pictures. It stores them in memory, even though it knows nothing about whether the memory is good or not. Right? It does all these operations afterwards. Right? So if you want, if you have a camera like that, you turn the camera on, take pictures very quickly, and then turn it off. Right? Then you see the light will come on to write the file much after you're finished because it's still trying to do this stuff. Right? So these are tricks you can do to make these things go faster. But essentially, there's nothing you can get away from these operations. Unless you want a machine to only work on that particular hardware, which is a really dumb thing to do. Right? Does that make sense? So you'll, you'll notice this thing, so when you, when you build your kernel, look at what is happening. You may not understand what precisely is going on, but you'll see that it's trying to probe different hardware. You'll keep printing stuff like, I noticed a hard drive which is 80 gig, and they'll tell you parameters about the hard drive and, all, and so on and so forth. It needs to know all the stuff to go on to all the things it can do afterwards. And essentially, that's that's the uh, that, that's the point I, I just mentioned. When you uh, how, how you boot up the machine, right? So you have to have all this all this uh, notions of what the firmware will do, um, where the boot sector has to be, and those are all fixed for the hardware. You as operating system have no control over that, right? This is another reason why I said do not try the first project on those two servers in that in that in that room, because they do a different way of booting up. They use what is called EFI which is sort of what your Mac, uh, new Mac computers use, right? Which is a different way of doing than BIOS, which may or may not be what you're used to, what you've seen before. So unless you know what you're doing, do not try to install on those two machines, right? Because it, it, it may be tricky, right? But essentially, uh, all these things, if all these things are set, your machine will boot up. If you corrupt one of these things, you get no feedback other than little thing like no system disk found, right? Many of you may have seen in, in the windows it'll say, no system disk found or no boot, boot sector found or something like that. And that essentially says, something does not know how to proceed. Um, once it proceeded to our operating system, then you get better, nicer uh, error messages. Right? The, the other, other philosophy is the notion of how you build operating systems, right? This is more of a problem for a challenge for, for companies uh, and, 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 and designers, future designers like you. And essentially, you're trying to balance a couple of uh, different <coughs> goals. Right? You have the notion of users, what they want. You have the notion of what the system, uh, you, you assume. You have to know what the system is designed for, and you're trying to manage those two. Right? So for example, as a user, you may want Faster, you, know, you want immediate uh, response, and you want all the you know you want it to be safe, reliable, and, and fast, right? And as an operating system designer, you have other goals, right? You want it to be reliable, you want it to be fair, you want it to be configurable, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? Microsoft has tens of thousands of people working on their operating system, right? They have every motivation to make sure that it's, it's easy to manage, easy to build, easy to do whatever they have to do. Right? Think of what Microsoft would have to do from the earlier side about booting. Right? Microsoft can, if you buy a Microsoft machine, you can practically run from 
an old processor to a new processor. It can run on machines which boot from BIOS or EFI. It can boot an, a very num large number of hard disks, a large number of memory, <coughs> large number of all this stuff, right? So when a machine boots up, it has to figure out what the configurations are, and it's probably going to have millions of combinations of, of different hardware and stuff, and it has to operate managing all those things to keep everyone happy, right? Everyone, including people who want to play games with it, who want to run this database server on it, who wants to run what have you, right? So it's not easy for them to do all for everybody. So what they do is they, they have different versions of operating systems. Right? They have version for operating system for home users. They have version for premium business users. They have one for servers and so on and so forth. Where they can tweak a little bit of those stuff, but even within that stuff, right? within the class, right? If I if I do a survey of the number of hardware variations that each one of you have on your desktop or laptop, right? I suspect that most of you will have a different combination of these components, right? You want all of them to work. So Microsoft has no reason to believe this, to want these things to be complicated. They want this to be as simple. They want to help you. They want to be reliable on those things. They don't want to be given the name that you know people, you know, birth of people jokes, right? But it's a hard task. And how you do that? So you have to have a notion of what does that user want, what is it that the um, that the system wants, and then try to balance those. Right? I forget how many of you here are uh, with Mac users. How many of you like like the way Macs do stuff? How many of you think it's it's more reliable or what have you of the Mac users? I suppose. So, do you can you give one reason why Macs can be more reliable than Windows? The same vein I was, I was just discussing. Yeah. Uh, they made a clean break when they made OS X. With all, they don't have any legacy code left over from OS nine. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So one of the things that they Max tend to do is they have a clean break with the past, right? Both in software and hardware, right? So they say we don't support this PS two style of keyboards. We don't support PS two style of mouse. We don't support serial cards and what have you, right? So they define the hardware that they can work on to be far more s smaller subset than what Windows users tend to do, right? So if you look at the Windows kernel, it, it tends to operate on a lot different set of machines than what you see on, a, on the Mac, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And, and Linux tends to work like Windows, right? I'm not giving Linux as an example, but Linux tends to work as Windows. I think the difference is Windows works on the very new stuff, the next slightly lags behind, right? So between these two, an operating system which can run on any hardware you can throw at it, and operating system which can only run on the few configurations that they sell, few configurations that they know how to use, right? And which says that we are not going to support any feature which is like seven years past, whereas Windows, you can still run your Windows, uh, Windows, you know, XP or the, the ones before that, right? Windows ME, Windows 2000, all those things. For the most part, tends to run on this stuff, right? What do you think about these two? Which is a good one, Mac or Windows? Mac or Windows? How many said Windows? How many said Mac? What do you think? What did the rest of them say? <laughs> you know the answer. I said I said the answer if you don't know what the question is, right? <laughs> it differs, right? Because I, 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 I honestly don't think that one is better than the other, right? These are two dis different design choices. They are two different trade-offs, right? So in that model, I mean, so you as a user may prefer one model or the, or the other, right? But it's not because it was not really thought through. It was this. It was thought through. Somebody decided that the users here want to run across all the hardware you can think, and somebody decided that this will not run on different hardware. Right? Once it understood that, the clear decision to make, if you're a Mac, was if it's old, get rid of it. Keep the operating system simple. When you boot up, it does not know anything about those. It does not know how to talk about it. So we'll only manage a few small subset which we know how to do it very well versus the other model which says 
we have to support everything ever built by any human being, right? So it could be a keyboard which was built in 89, right? Which somebody put it in the old machine. And as long as it's sort of okay, it will still have to work, right? Which means that you, your kernel now has to deal with a whole bunch of these things. When it boots up, it has to figure out what kind of configuration you have and try to manage those things. And then you have to use, get used to the fact that somebody will say, I took my, um, my grandfather's PC from 1985 and tried to put Windows XP on it, and it's extremely slow, right? It looks like a joke, but you see stuff like that, different versions in the, in the bread, right? I have a machine with like four megs of memory, and the machine is impossible to boot up, right? And so as a developer, you, you realize that there's nothing you can do. You can't do magic. You just go with that. And the other thing you want to remember is you want to figure out the def separate the policy from the implementation, right? You want to separate the policy from the mechanism. Policy tells you um, what should be done, and and mechanism says how to do it, right? So when you go from Windows 2000 to Windows XP to Windows Vista or what have you, right? Your systems cost everything. You you deal with policies, not mechanisms, right? When you do open call. You expect the system to open a file. You don't specify how it should open the file, what it should read, where it should go, and all those things. Right? So if you define it like this, then essentially Windows 2000 would do things a lot different than Windows XP, would do things a lot different in Windows Vista. So you as a user may find that things are faster in Vista, are slower in 2000 or what have you. But the functionality is the same. right? And you want to keep that because that helps the, the OS design. So they know exactly what you want, not how you want it. So it's, it's a separate mechanism from the policy to make it easier for the, the operating system. Right? And that's, that's one functionality of this Windows 32 and all those API. Right? It does not tell you what exactly should happen, how much time it should take, or what exactly should happen in the hardware. It just tells you what your policy is, implementation is implemented, and tell you after the operating system. Right? And, and these are. Again, not something unique to operating system. If you take a software engineering course, that's what they strive for. The reason why you mention it here is operating system is one of the biggest pieces of software that is out there. Critical piece of software, you expect it to be fast, used in a large number of places. So you want all the techniques we know in software engineering and all those stuff to make this thing pull this up, right? You will, you'll, you'll be surprised to find how complicated things are for things that you, you consider to be trivial, right? So back in 2000, I knew somebody who was at uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, whose job was to design the look of the control panel. Right? If you use any of the Windows machines, which is similar to Mac 2, right? There's this, this notion of a control panel. Right? You, it tells you how to configure different stuff. Their job is to figure out how to present information on the control panel, not what those things do, but how to present it. Right? So, for example, how should the icons look? What should the title be, and all those things, right? That's their job, day in, day out, throughout the years, right? If you look at it, it doesn't look like it's. It, you need somebody to look at design this stuff, because that seems like the most trivial of the thing, right? So, is it? You know, you have like tens of thousands of users, and I don't know if there's any human being who knows precisely all the stuff which happens within a Windows machine, right? They may know little bits and pieces. They may not know every piece of code because it's like millions of lines of code, right? And that's because you have the drivers and stuff which muddy the whole thing. So it's 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 pretty hard to manage this big collection, and you know, there's a challenge that they will face. Right? So in terms of structuring the operating system, there are a number of different ways of doing that. Some of them are simple, layered, microkernel, and modular, right? Let me talk a little bit about virtual machine. So simple is, if your example is Microsoft, the uh, MS DOS, right? Simple operating system is how you would develop the operating system if you're doing this as the first thing in your life, right? Which is sort of where this thing came from. You try to put everything into this one big piece of code, right? Your, your operating system knows everything. So you have this one large piece of code. It knows about the driver. It knows about the different stuff. You put everything into this one big soup. And you try to make it do stuff, right? It's faster because there's no abstraction, there is no what have you. So you can move anything wherever you want. There's no clear abstraction, meaning the, the whatever you call device driver, which interacts with the hardware, can talk to anything else, can kind of talk to the application directly, 
applications can directly talk to their uh, drivers or what have you, right? So you have this one flexible program that anybody can talk to anything. So you get extreme performance because anybody can talk to anybody, right? But it's also a nightmare to modif modify and maintain, right? Once you go beyond a certain number of hardware, this thing will literally become bigger and bigger. Eventually, you have no idea how to manage these things, right? So for the most part, we don't use these simple operating systems anymore because it's very hard to manage because you have all these things in one pixel, so, right? If you look at the modern operating systems, they, they come to you in a DVD, right? You can't expect to put the five gigs or so of code into this one big giant stuff and then have some human being manage that, right? But that's the essentially what you what you do. And once you figure that doesn't work, you 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 create layers, right? You create different layers such that you can define policies on what each layer should do to the next layer, right? And you leave the mechanisms up to the different layers, right? And if you do the layers right, then you can en enforce those policies. You don't allow the layers to be crossed except through certain boundaries, right? For example, if you do a system call, right? If I define a system call interface as the only way for you to interact with the kernel, right, and no other way, right, then I can precisely define what I'm supposed to give the next layer, right? If I'm the kernel, I can say I support system calls, open, close, read, write, that's it, right? You don't know how I do it. I'm not going to tell you what mechanism I implement to do any of these functions. All I give you is this policy of what, I, what you want. Then I can continue to optimize my layer, right? As long as I provide the functionality to you, you're good, right? So that's that's the notion of a um, layered operating system. And then you can have different different components perform the the right task, you know, optimize them to, to different stuff. But it's easy, easier to manage. So now we can have a different. You can have a kernel group and the application group, which don't have to talk except when they have to change the interface. Right. Otherwise, they can continue to work on the stuff. So you'll you'll end up with people who know something about a lot about file systems and practically nothing about the rest of the file system. Right. But it, this makes it easier to manage and, and uh, use these systems. Um, so, for example, if you so if this is one one way you can you can split these machines up. So you have a notion of you put all the lower level stuff like device drivers and all those things at one layer, right? And you define and the, the kernel developers define a way for device drivers to talk to the kernel, right? So for example, the kernel may, may want to talk to all the devices a certain way. So if you have like a hard disk or a keyboard, something has to make convert what the hardware, hard disk and, and keyboards do to a form understandable by, by the kernel, right? So this way, the device drivers only know how to take their device to be able to talk to the kernel, right? And kernel developer will use this abstraction to build more complicated functions part of it, right? So the, the, the cleaner the definition is, everybody knows what these functions are. Then you can kind of outsource the different development to different groups, right? So you as a kernel developer can assume that the kinds of devices you'll deal with are character, block, based on. We'll, we'll see what those are as we move along, right? But essentially, you, you don't really know about the details, whether it's a Seagate hard drive or a Maxter hard drive or a Hitachi hard drive. It's a ATA, you know, ATA or SATA or SCSI and all those things, right? Those are all dealt by these things. And all you get is a generic hard drive, which can do some functions. And then you build this on top of it. And it, it, this seems like an obvious thing to do, because in any of the programming courses you take, this is what you'll probably be taught to, you know, keep a clean interface and all those things. It was not that obvious because we went through the Microsoft DAS and operations of that, of that nature. Right? The, the next abstraction is the notion of microkernel, which was very popular in, in like uh, early 90s, and then it kind of um, went out of fashion, and now it's back sort of thing. Right? So the, the idea here is, rather than building this one kernel, something like what Microsoft uh, Microsoft NT kernel does, right? Which is what is used by based on all those things, right? Rather than have this one thing, it'd be nice if you can have like a kernel which is extremely small, extremely powerful, does very little stuff, and then build these things on top of it, right? Which can picture application or, or something like a server, 
which will implement the different uh, me mechanisms, right? So the idea here is you want you have a hard disk, right? You want to use the hard disk in a machine, right? So the the microkernel knows a little bit. It knows how to schedule who should operate on the disk, right? If you can develop something which implements a file system, right? Something like a Windows file system, something like a Unix file system on top of it, right? The idea here is the kernel will be extremely fast. You build these different file systems which together give you the system that you want, right? So the idea here is you will be able to run on the same exact machine, Windows and Linux simultaneously because these both want the hardware, right? So you implement what Microsoft Windows does, what Linux wants, right? And interact with the with the hardware. We'll, we'll see a little bit more as we as we move along. But the idea here is both of them want access to hard disk, right? So as long as you can, as the kernel can say, this application, this request should go to the Windows disk. This should go to the the uh, Linux disk, right? It does not have to worry what operating system really runs, right? All you care is the Windows disk will not have access to Linux and, and so on and so forth. So the, the kernel in this notion would, would only make sure that it'll, it'll give the right hard disk to the right person, and you, as application, decide what to do. So you can, you can create something like Windows, something like uh, 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 Linux, on the same exact hardware, and all of these things will work. And it will become clearer as we, as we move along. It's a way, different way to organize this stuff, right? And this is what the, uh, your Mac OS X does, right? The, the Apple OS X does. So essentially, you have the, the operating system on this machine, which is called Mac. It came out of uh, CMU in the uh, late 80s, right? So there's this Mac running, right? You may have, you may have heard that Mac is a uh, uh, FreeBSD based system, right? But essentially, FreeBSD is a server running on top of, top of Mac, right? So it looks like, if you log into the machine, it looks like it's a FreeBSD machine. It looks, acts like a FreeBSD machine, but it's not, right? Because the FreeBSD is an application built on top of Mac, right? The Mac is so small, it can be fast, right? So you don't, you shouldn't have any performance penalties. So it looks like this. And the, um, some of the kernel environment, so you, you, you ask application, you can go through the BST, or you can directly access the mock services. If Apple so chose, they can actually implement a Windows parallel to the stuff, right? In such a fashion that in your machine, you can run Windows and Linux at the same time. And also the access the mark and how this can work, right? I don't think Apple has a motivation to run Windows on this machine, but they do run FreeBSD. So if you if you it's not a FreeBSD machine, Mac is a Mac machine, right? That's that's the real kernel which is underneath. It gives an impression of a FreeBSD, but it's not FreeBSD, right? You'll notice it sometimes, but most of the time you don't notice that. Right? This is a way to organize a system, so you can kind of plug and play. So the, the idea here is you can have like a Lego kind of computing. So you can kind of say, I want Mac. I want FreeBSD for you. I want Mac. I want Windows for you. I want Mac. I want Linux for you. So if you can build this Mac to be extremely portable, extremely good, then all of this is possible, right? Of, of course, reality is never that easy, and um, pretty at least Mac, yeah, Windows, uh, Apple still uses that. The last way of organizing these things is through modules, right? Modules is something that you you you, you would have all uh, seen in your, in your Windows machine, especially. The idea here is rather than having this clean slate stuff, right? You kind of attach new code into the kernel. You kind of load these things into the kernel, so now the kernel kind of grows with you, right? If you use the the uh, these are the, the dynamically loaded uh, libraries, and I think Windows calls it .dot so files, right? So essentially, the, the, the kernel decides that I need to operate on a printer from HP, right? So it looks up what's the driver for HP, uh, HP this particular driver. It loads it. So now the operating system includes whatever was there plus this new HP stuff, right? So if you added a new Epson printer, 
then you can add this stuff. So when you run a, a, a Windows Windows operating system on your machine, your Windows really is Windows plus all these different modules, right? They all become part of the kernel. So your Windows is not the same as your friend's Windows. And that's one of the reasons why your Windows may crash on something, your friend's Windows may not. Because these are, so they attach themselves into the operating system. Now, based on the modules you have, you have a different variant of the operating system than what somebody else will have, right? It's a, it's a good, good way to build these systems, but it's also a, a, a debugging nightmare, right? So as you can imagine, all these drivers, you, you, you trust all these drivers, and some of them may, may destroy the machine, some of them don't, because you're kind of adding them into the operating system, right? So, but that, that's a pretty popular way, because that's, that's what you get. So if you buy most of the Windows machine, they, they give you a driver disk. Essentially, you install this driver, and when the machine puts up, if it sees a particular hard, uh, hardware, it says, I need the driver for the hardware, loads it, biggest part of the kernel, and now things will fail. Sometimes things will work, other times. If it fails, the answer is to remove the module or remove the hardware, and so on and so forth. Right? So these are different ways you can, you can organize this operating system. Is any one of them going to make the system faster or slower? Not, 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 I'm not talking about minuscule differences, right? Now, obviously, every implementation will have different states, but in the larger scheme, right, would microkernel-based system make your application run faster than something which uses modules? In this case, I don't think it depends on in the in the larger sense, right? It does not depend in the larger sense because if you want certain things to be done, it does not really matter where the code is, right, from a performance perspective, whether it's in the microkernel plus the FreeBSD or whether it's in the same structure, whether it's coming as a module or whatever, right? If I have to do 10 operations, harder operations to get your program going, right? <coughs> Me placing it in a different fashion, me calling it that's microkernel, this is calling you know, modules and all those things, should not make a big difference for you, right? These are all ways to organize the system so it's useful, easy to manage, and all those things. From, from a user perspective, you don't particularly care. You say, I want my hardware to do 10 operations, and if I do everything right, all this different stuff should still keep it at the same speed, right? There will be some differences, because the more layers you have, the more abstractions you have, the more things slow down, right? But in general, they should all be the same. Right? Again, this goes back to the notion of the operating system cannot do magic. If you want, if your application needs something from the hardware, it can try to move things around to make it appear faster, but that's about it. Right? And which you can do in any of these approaches. Right? But, but each one it makes it easier, harder to manage these things. Right? The last topic, which is the notion of virtual machines, which is getting a lot of lot of uh, traction these days, right? Many of you may have used virtual machines on your laptop, uh, VMware, uh, Palace, and all those things. The idea here is the, the operating systems tend to be, like as, as many of you uh, see, you know, they crash. And all the operating systems I've used crash at some point, for, for the most part. Right? So you have all these issues. So rather than building an operating system, like making an operating system from scratch, the notion of virtual machines would be that I create a virtual, so I boot up my machine, right? come up to operating system state, where I can provide enough services that I can create a virtual machine for you, and you do whatever with that virtual machine. So I create an abstraction of a hardware, and you install something on top of it. right? So you could use that to boot up Mac, and <coughs> run, install Windows into a virtual machine, which will call me for services, right? And what you can do is, once you can do this virtual stuff, I can have virtual Linux, virtual Mac, whatever, running on the same exact machine. Each of the machines will notice that they're running on their own little virtual stuff, right? 
So they can do whatever they want. They can crash the machine, but they won't destroy the underlying machine, right? And that's the promise of virtual machines. The reason why you like those stuff is when you, when you go to internet computing, when you go to web, web browsers and web servers and stuff, essentially I'm, I'm, I'm letting you run some code on my server, right? You're running, I'm letting you run your database code, your, your web code, and all those things. So if I can create a virtual machine for each one of your requests, I don't have to worry about it. So in this machine, I can create a virtual, so when you log in, if I can create a virtual machine for you, you are free to trash it, you're free to destroy the machine, but you don't destroy anything else, and that has a lot of power in, in, in those kind of operations. The other uh, popular way of uh, using computers these days is uh, our data centers, right? So where something like AOL has tens of thousands of machines stacked away somewhere, and you as a customer says, I want 1,000 machines, 1,000 processors, right? You go tell AOL, they give you 1,000 stuff, right? So rather than giving you 1,000 hard machines, they can give you the thousand virtual machines, let you do whatever you want, and that's the way to manage it. We will see a little bit more of that in the, in the next lecture. But this is getting a lot more traction because of all these newer trends um, where operating systems are no longer controlled by one organization but by multiple different clients. Right? So I'll see you guys on, on Thursday.